all together. You're all together. Just have one more, just one more, just one more. Go here with me. So all to Jesus I surrender. I give myself. I give myself. I give myself to you. And I will ever love and trust him. And I I give myself, I give myself, I give myself. Last time, here I am. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow. Here I am to sing. You're my God. You're all together. You're all together. Love me. brought us again to the place of rest, a place where we can sit our burdens down, sit at your feet, be refreshed by your presence, learn of your word, testify of your goodness, give from your abundance. Now, Father, we have come to hear a word from the Lord. We ask uh, that you disappoint us not. Once again, Lord, I ask that you break up the ground of our hearts and make it a fertile place for your word to take lodge, to grow, and to bring forth fruit in our lives. In the precious and wonderful name of Jesus, let everybody say amen. God is good, what do you say? Amen. And all the time, God is good. Amen, 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 amen. This, this afternoon, I thought I could get morning in and the clock changed. But, uh, this afternoon, we are continuing continuing our series on conquerors. Amen. Last week we talked about David and, and the places where he needed to conquer. The message last week was this battle is not, uh, not the Lord's, it's yours because until and unless we are willing to get in the fight, come on say amen. amen. Uh, I found even as a pastor that if folk don't want anything, there's really nothing I can do for them. Huh? I, I'll fight by your side if you're willing to fight, but I can't fight a battle in which you are unwilling to be engaged. Today's message. Today's message is entitled, Where Conquerors Conquer. Where Conquerors Conquer. And once again, I'm going to ask that you Pardon the bench. As last week, I told you I can talk a little bit, and, and I could even walk a little bit, but sometimes standing still kind of gets to me. So uh, if, I, if I'm seated, it's not again extreme trifling. Amen, 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 amen. This morning, I want to begin with a subject that we don't always like to talk about, and that is conflict conflict we need to begin talking about conflict because I found that if we're going to have a discussion uh, talking about conquerors uh, there is a necessary element that's there and that element is conflict for you ask the question, is it possible 
to be a conqueror without some type of conflict. Huh? Uh, how can you overcome without an opponent? How can you triumph without turmoil or proceed without pushback or rise without resistance? Huh? Is it possible to accomplish without acrimony or achieve without adversity, uh, to have celebration without complication or success without struggle. Somehow conquering necessitates the presence somewhere of conflict. What I'm simply saying is if you are going to be a conqueror, th there's going to be some conflict somewhere. When I was in high school, I remember we studied about the different kinds of conflict in literature. Uh, in fact, we found um, that, that without conflict, uh, there is no plot. Huh? How many of you have ever read a story where Mary got in a boat and rode to the other side and they lived happily ever after? Huh? Nice story. Uh, a sequence of events that you would like to happen on a Sunday afternoon, but it does not prove to be an interesting thought or story because there is no conflict. Uh, I learned in school that there are different types of conflict. Huh? First, there is external conflict. What kind? external conflict. We learned about man against man conflict. Huh? You know, that's when you, 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 you battling it out with somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's also man against nature conflict. Huh? Uh, that, that's, that, 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 that's when the sailors are on the boat and they're trying to ride through the storm, but the storm has more power. Huh? Uh, there's also man against Society, huh? Uh, you see that a lot of times in your hero stories, huh? Everybody's wrong but you, and you're going to go out with the banner of justice yes, and right societal wrongs. In addition to external conflicts, there is one primary internal conflict. Internal. And this is the one we don't like. That's man against himself, huh? Yes. Uh, you, 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 you know, you experience that conflict every January 2nd. I say January 2nd because January 1st is the day that you pay the money for the gym membership, get your brand new shoes, lace up with all of your sports gear, and you're in the gym. Now, you can't even get a treadmill on January 1st, but January 2nd, uh, that's where there's internal conflict, man against himself. Huh? But I even found that there are some, some types of conflict that, that I guess they didn't have them when I was in school because I, I don't remember them. Huh? There's man against fate. When someone is fighting the inevitable. Uh, here's a new one. Here's a new one. Some of y'all face this. At work, there's man against technology. Huh? Huh? Uh, when, I, when I was in engineering, we, we had a guy, and I don't know, we just called him the Terminator. Because for some reason, whenever this guy walked by your cubicle, stuff was just going to start acting up. And, 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 and drives were just going to get wiped. We were like, don't let the Terminator walk by your cube. Man against technology. Uh, there's another, there's another. And that's man against the supernatural. Now, the reason we begin in conflict is because in the 26th chapter of the, uh, the book of Genesis, it is a chapter that is fraught with conflict. Even from the very first verse, listen to the text. It says, and there was famine. There was what? Famine. There was famine. Famine in the land. Already there's conflict. Huh? Famine. Famine means that somehow 
uh, all of the elements of nature are not operating in their regular and expected order uh, such that there is going to be a shortage somehow that will prevent the regular production of foodstuffs necessary for survival, which holds the potential that somebody is going to die. If that's not conflict, I don't know what it is. In fact, that conflict, that conflict uh, that we see in the very first verse that, that God is setting up here is, is the conflict, the potential for man against nature. There was a famine in the land. Besides the first famine in the days of Abraham, and Isaac went unto Abimelech, the king of the Philistines of Gear. Look at verse 2. Look at verse 2. And the Lord appeared to him, talking about Isaac. It says, Go not down into Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Notice that, A, we see the setup of a conflict. But notice that there are a couple of things that God instructs Isaac to do. Number one, he tells him, don't go to Egypt like Father Abraham did. In terms of our conflict, what God is saying is, Isaac, you cannot outrun or avoid this conflict. I'm not going to let you get around this conflict. And then secondly, he says, dwell in the land that I will tell thee of. Ah. In other words, God's intention is not to prevent this conflict. He's not going to allow Isaac to avoid the conflict, and God is not going to prevent the conflict. God isn't going to allow uh, uh, Isaac to, 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 to say some kind of hocus pocus and, and speak against the, the, the famine and the famine is gone. Huh? God is not going to allow him to any, in any way dissipate this, this conflict. Why? Because God is telling Isaac in this text, we're going to ride this one out, young boy. Huh? We're going to ride this one out. Every now and again, God ordains that we go through a difficulty, huh? Every now and then, God ordains that we go through a conflict. And, 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 and I need to pause for a second because in 2013, we are living amongst a generation of believers who no longer believes that God allows uh, 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 conflicts in the lives of the people of God. No longer believes that God allows us to go through famine or like Elder Walker talked about this morning. No longer believe that God allows us to go through storms. But, but I don't find it in the text this morning. He says, Isaac, you're not going to get around it. Uh, 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 he says, Isaac, I'm not going to stop at you. you. You can't say some stuff that, that allows it to dissipate. We, we've got to ride this through, and this is consistent with Scripture. God doesn't get rid of our storms, but this is the same God that says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I won't fear any evil. He does not say that the shadow of death is not there. He simply suggests that the shadow of death is a walking path through which the saints of God traverse through with God as our exercise partner. Right. Yeah. 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 First conflict is a conflict of, of, of man, man against nature. We talked about on last week the premise of our series, and that is that God gives us an abundance of his grace, uh, but his grace does not prevent us, release us from the responsibility of being conquerors. As we look into the text, immediately we began to see the grace of God. Listen to it. Look for the grace. 
And the Lord appeared to him and said, Go not down to Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall, shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee. Uh -huh, I see the grace. And I will bless thee, for unto thee and unto thy seed will I give all of these countries, and I will perform the oath that I swear unto Abraham thy father, and I will make thy seed as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy seed all of these countries, uh, excuse me, give unto thy seed all of these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, and my statutes, and my laws. The grace of God in this passage is magnificent, but it is even more so when you consider the backdrop of the conflict that we just introduced. Ah. It is in the backdrop of famine that God says, but Isaac, you're going to be blessed. Ah. Isaac, you, 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 you are going to, to, to partake of the abundance of God. You see, just because there is a famine on earth does not mean that there's a food shortage in heaven. Huh? Huh? Just because there is a recession on earth, it does not mean that the buying power of the windows of heaven have lessened anymore. Huh? The promises of God are true and the first thing that we need to realize today is that conquerors trust in what? In the promises of God. He says Isaac it's going to be a famine but if you stay right here if you stay right in the land that I say, don't try to run from the famine. Don't believe that I'm going to turn it away or you can do anything to stop it. But stay right here and I will bless you even in the midst of a difficult season. Yes. Conquerors trust in the promises of God. How many know what God can do in a difficult season? Huh? Huh? How many know that when everybody else is, is having trouble, you can still be blessed? Huh? How many knows when everybody else's 401k uh, is going down, they can still find oil on your land? Now, come on, somebody say amen. God can bless however he wants to. In fact, when you begin to look closely at the text, uh, you can see what God can do in the midst of a famine season. Look at verse number 12. Isaiah, excuse me, Genesis 26 and verse 12, yeah. talking about what God can do in a difficult season. Text says, then Isaac sold into the land and received the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Isaac sold into a land, a famished land, and the Bible says the same year he receives a hundredfold. Y'all not feeling it? Some dirty, dusty, cracked up ground. I I Isaac drops one watermelon seed. Y'all don't hear me. Y'all don't hear me. <laughs> one watermelon seed, and, and there's watermelon everywhere. Y'all, you don't hear that. They running down the aisle. They don't have enough. Hundred watermelons, one seed. That's what God can do in a famished period. Huh? A hundredfold. What in the world happened when he busted that first one open and got the, the, the 25 seeds out of that first slice? Huh? And the text says, the text says, the text says, verse uh, number 13, and the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. I'm talking about what God can do in a difficult period. It says not only was he an amazing farmer, he just, just, just dropped the seed and stuff coming up everywhere. But it says that Isaac became rich. That Isaac became rich 
And as he went forward, he became very rich. Uh, I'm talking about what God can do in a, a famine season. God made him rich. And then as he proceeded, uh, the text is suggesting that he went from being rich to being filthy rich. Huh? He, he went from, from just having one uh, used bins to, to having a dealership. Y'all, y'all, you know, you know. He became, he became filthy rich. That's, that's what God can do in a difficult, difficult season. And the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. For he had possessions of flocks, possessions of herds, great stores, great stores, great stores, great stores, servants. Ah, and the Philistines envied him. Isaac had the kind of richness now that could move markets. Uh, you, you know, so flocks and land. In fact, can you hear it? The word goes out over Twitter that, that Isaac is no longer interested in, in Johnson sheep shearers. And Johnson sheep shearers stock prices drop by 60 percent. And, and even the price of, of steel drops by 10 percent. The market is down by 2%. Huh? Isaac has that kind of wealth. And the Bible says so much so that the Philistines envied him. I, I told you that, that you cannot be a conqueror without having conflict. And even though God is blessing, there is conflict. There's conflict right there. Notice what the text says. Philistines envied him. Verse 15. For all of the wells which his father's servants digged in the days of Abraham, his father. The Philistines stopped them and filled them with dirt. And Abimelech said to Isaac, go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. First thing I need you to see is we have a transition in the conflict. We have moved from the conflict of man against nature. Now we're in the full throat of the kinds of conflict that we are all familiar with, and that's man against man. Yeah, yeah. Ah. The Bible says that Isaac is just trying to, trying to be a simple businessman, and he, he's providing. He's, uh, and it says that, that, that the wells, the wells, the wells that Abraham, his father, digged, the Philistines stop them up. They, they were trying to, to, to prevent uh, 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 Isaac from being the mogul that he was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They stopped them up with sand or dirt thinking that somehow you can stop by human effort the blessings of a divine and powerful God. But the more uh, they attacked Isaac, the more he grew and the more he prospered. Yeah. Yeah. Filled him with dirt. Finally, the text says in verse 16, and Abimelech says to Isaac, go from us for thou art mighty. What he's suggesting here is, Isaac, we need you to leave because you have now become a man that is full of power. Watch the progression. I'm talking about what God can do in a famine season. He started out and, and he went from being rich to being filthy rich. And now the text says that he has power. 
There, there, there are a lot of folk who have money who don't have power. But I can pretty much guarantee you that the folk who have real power know how to get money whenever they, they get ready to get money. Huh? The folk who pull the levers of power in our nation's capital, they don't worry about our money per se because whether they have it when they're in power or not, they know as soon as they step out of elected office, they're going to be able to cash in because if you got power, you can get some money. Come on, say amen. And the text says that Abimelech says, uh, you already filthy rich, but, but now you have become a, a big baller and a shot caller and, and, and we cannot deal with you. Uh, can you get your stuff and leave town? You're too big for Nashville, uh, 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 Isaac. And, uh, uh, maybe you, they can find a little spot on the, on the edge of Antioch somewhere because, because uh, 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 we, we can't handle your kind here. Talking about conflict this yeah. afternoon. Mm. Watch it. And Isaac departed then and pitched his tent in the valley of Giar and dwelt there. Verse 18, Isaac digged again. Uh, he's in Antioch now, you know what I'm talking about, just kind of on the side. Uh, there, there, there's, there's no, uh, what is it, Green Hills and all the shops and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Now he, he's, he's, he's getting drinks from Sonic now, you, you yeah, see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And Isaac digged again the wells of water. And when they, uh, when they had digged in the days of Abraham his father, for the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. Watch it. And he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley, and they found a wellspring of water. Verse 20, and the herdsmen of Giar did strive with Isaac's herdsmen, uh, saying, the water is ours. And he called the name of the well Essek because they strove with him. Watch this thing. He's, he's wealthy. He gets out in the countryside and, and he sees wells that look like the ones his his daddy had, 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 had built, but, 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 the, but the Gihar brothers had changed the names of the well, somehow believing that Isaac wouldn't recognize what was his. Huh? Trying to keep him from that which was, which was lawfully his. And, and the Bible says that what Isaac would do is he would redig the well, hit pay dirt, and, and he would recall it the name that that it was originally given. He, 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 he is conflict with the natives, and yet he is continually blessed. Continually. He was blessed when he was uh, 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 with the Philistines, and now they pushed him out, and he's in the valley of Giar, and, and he's, still, he's still blessed. The Bible says that the herdsmen of Gion strived with Isaac's herdsmen, and they said the water is ours, and, and they called the name of the well Essek. A couple of things. First of all, you notice here uh, in, in the text that, that Isaac is quarreling with a whole different group of brothers. And yet every time he digs, God blesses him. The other thing I want you to notice is Isaac gets to a well, and it says that he names the well Essek. Previously, the text says that Isaac was calling the wells after the names that Abraham, his father, had called them. If Isaac is now naming new wells, that means that he, he's hitting on some stuff that even daddy did not find. And he calls he calls the name of the place Essek. That means contention. Oh, y'all, 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 you don't understand. He, he digs the well. He does the work. 
And the brothers say that, that's ours. That's our water. Did, did you, don't, you, you was in Nash. Nobody told you to come out here to Antioch. And this, this, this was ours before it was yours. He says this is a contentious place. But notice his response. Notice his response. Verse 21. And they digged another well. And they strove for that also. And they called the name of it Sitna. That means he called it Sitna, which means hatred. He's in Nashville. He prospers. They tell him to get out. He goes to Antioch, he prospers, and they say, that's our stuff. Yeah. Now he's deep in Rutherford County. He's in Murfreesboro yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? He digs in the well in Murfreesboro, and, and he's blessed again, and, and, and he has to call the whole city a place of haters because they wouldn't allow him, him to do everywhere he goes. There is contention and strife. But here's what I need you to notice. In the midst of conflict, Isaac does not find it necessary to battle with the men in this place. Some of us believe that conflict necessitates battle. Huh? You roll up on me, I'm going to roll up on you. Huh? You brought conflict, I'm going to bring a battle. And we're always um, not just contending, but we, we ready to roll. But Isaac doesn't find it necessary battle, even in the midst of conflict. Does not the text say, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities? God is letting us know that the battle ain't against each other. Yeah, yeah. Huh? Why? Because People are not the objects of warfare. If anything, we are the spoils of warfare. You all are who God is fighting over, not who we're supposed to be fighting with. Conflict does not necessitate battle. And I know y'all not feeling this, but but he says when they would fight over this well, Isaac would say, you know what, you can have it. Let me tell you why he can do that. Isaac sees no need to fight for something that was given to him in the first place. Y'all didn't hear me, huh? No need to fight for something that was given to him in the first place. In other words, because God gave it to me, he can give me some more. Yeah. See, what the old folks said is true. Whatever you do to get it is the same thing you got to do to keep it. The reason some of us keep fighting is because God didn't give it to us in the first place. We use fighting and conniving and, and, and all manner of ungodly activity to get that thing. And there's no guarantee that you can maintain it any other way but to continue the foolishness. Isaac does not have to fight for this thing because that's not where God wants his conquering to be. Which brings us to our, our second one. 
not only do conquerors trust in the promises of God, but they live by the provisions of God. God gave it to me, and if y'all want to clown over it, he can give me some more. You know what? You can have it, but I'm going to tell you, it may not work the same for you as, the, as it worked for me because when I had it, it came with the blessings of God, but you took it with some foolishness. I want to see if it'll work with you without God's blessings. Go ahead and take it because God can provide for me over here. Fight for stuff that God gave you. Huh? It's the same principle. Paul, Paul told the folk, how is it that that which you, which was given to you by faith, now you're trying to maintain by works? If God gave you your salvation by faith, it, it's to be maintained the same way you got. You, 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 what, you want it? <laughs> Isaac. Isaac is not that type of conqueror. Because that which came by the blessings of God will be maintained by the blessings. Watch it, watch it, watch it. Watch it. Verse number 22. I love it. And he removed from thence and did another well. And for that they strove not. And he called the name of it Rehoboth. For he says, the Lord has made room for us. And we shall dwell. Huh? We shall dwell in a fruitful land. Isaac, having moved from Nashville to Antioch, to Rutherford, now moves all the way to, to Grundy County. Y'all don't even know what it is. At, at the foothills of the mountains, neither the Philistines or, 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 or the Gearites are barely know what it is, more or less are interested in contending there. And the Bible says that that they dig a well, and I can see them looking around, and, 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 and nobody's following, and water starts gushing from everywhere, and they're still looking around, and they say, nobody is fighting with us. Rehoboth means space. It's that God has finally made room for me. Oh, I wish I had some folk in this church who knows that God can make room for you when there was no room, huh? How many folk know that God can give you the position when it wasn't listed nowhere in the classifieds ads, when, when there wasn't a job to be had, and yet God still makes a way out of no way? How many knows huh, that God can provide room in a situation when it was absolutely hopeless, that God can create open spaces? He looks around, Charles, and he said, now this is nice. Huh? I may not have all the nice restaurants, but at least I ain't got to wake up fighting every day. This is, this is really nice. He says, God has made room. I'm a witness that God has made room. When God called my family to the seminary, 
my wife was in a medical fellowship that she abruptly quit, packed up our stuff, moved to Bering Springs, Michigan, the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary, filled out all the paperwork, got the loans. I made it through my first summer, 4.0. Summer's coming to an end, filling out paperwork, financial aid for the fall. Then I realized that after I pay my tuition and after I pay my rent, I have $1,600 to live in September, October, November, and December. That's $400 a month total that don't include food, utility, car note, Insurance, yes, shoes, tan up. Right. <laughs> and I'm going to be honest, y'all. I, I lost it. Oh. Began to cry. Because yes, I realized that somehow I had gotten to a place and I could not afford to be. But at this point, Brother Morris, I did, couldn't afford to, to leave. Okay. <laughs> I began praying. Some weeks later, I got a call from a friend to preach at a church in Chicago, Illinois. I had my sermon. It was all ready to go. And one of my boys was at my, my house late, late Thursday night. He started talking. Stop talking. <laughs> and he kept talking. He just kept just shouting my goodness. I said, stop, stop. And all of a sudden, he saw my face. He said, what's wrong with you? I said, man, God, you just changed my sermon. I got to start over. <laughs> my wife drove. We were halfway to Chicago before God finished that word. Wow. Uh, but somewhere, somewhere, somewhere on Interstate 80, Say I got the word. Man, we had church that Sabbath. Make a long story short, three days later, I get a call from South Central Conference. They're saying this preacher whose church you preached at, who's a former conference president, called our office raving about a young Mississippi boy who preached up in his church. He said, the boy don't know your name. All he knows is you a former engineer and your wife is a is a doctor, and, and they say, well, we know a guy like that, but he's not in the seminary, and they actually had to call the seminary to see if there's an Ed Harden there. Huh? Yeah. They said, we, we can't help you if, you if you're over 35. How old are you? I said, I'm 35. Huh? Yeah. They brought us down. They brought us down to Nashville, and, and they interviewed us, and what they told me is, that after they got the call, they, they didn't know if they had funds to pay for anybody to go to school. But they searched the record books. I'm talking about God making room for you. And they found that a year previous, a year earlier, they had voted a position that they had never filled. Y'all don't hear me, huh? 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 And within three weeks, I got the call from South Central that we are now going to pay your tuition through seminary and give you a thousand dollars a month to live on and after they told us that they say and by the way can you fill out the application for the job that we just gave you I'm talking about the fact that God can make room for you uh, my classmates who went to Oakwood and Southern were like dude Man, my daddy, my cousin, my, my uncle, they all ministers. I, 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 I brown nosed everybody I can, and, and I couldn't get sponsored to the seminary. You ain't nobody uh, who comes from not a ministry heritage. You here just a couple of months, and now you sailing on through Rehoboth. God will make room for you. Come on, somebody. Uh, because conquerors, not only trust in the promises of God, 
but they live by the provisions of God. Listen, 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 listen. Listen. And so we live in this strange environment of, of conquering and conflict. See, like just when you start to make it on this side, huh? kids acting conflict on this side. Just when you get this thing settled, this thing erupts, conquering conflict. Conquering conflict. How do you maintain your sanity in such an environment? I'm, I'm glad you ask. Yeah. Look, look at verse. Look at verse number number twenty-three. Twenty-three. And he went up from thence to Beersheba. Somebody say Beersheba. And the Lord appeared to him. The same night it says, I'm the God of Abraham, thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply uh, thy seed for my servant's sake. And he built it an altar there. And he called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. Y'all would have thought that after he went from being rich to filthy rich to a powerful mogul, to finally him running the whole Grundy County out there by the side of the mountain, that it would be all good. But he had to make one more stop. He had to get to Beersheba. He had to get to his place of worship where he could get into the presence of God. Why? Because when you live in a cycle of conflict and conquering, conflict and conquering, the only way you can maintain your praise is to regularly get into the presence of God. Why? Because conquerors not only trust in the promises of God and not only live uh, by the provisions of God, but conquerors maintain their praise. They maintain their praise to God. He says, he says, I had to get to Beersheba. He said, Rehoboth, the nice God made room for me, but, 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 but this is not where I meet God. He built an altar at Beersheba, and he worshiped. So some of us, when we, when we, when we doing it, all right, I don't really see you. It's only when stuff is tough. Do I see you on Wednesday night and Tuesday night and Wednesday morning, Sabbath school? We, we, we've got to maintain our praise to God. Oh, the clock is against me. Let me get to the end. Even in Beersheba, text say, oh, and by the way, he built he dug a well. <laughs> Come on, somebody say amen. And it brought forth water. Yes, sir. Isaac. Isaac is doing so well. Even in Grundy County. That the text says that even the folk in Nashville take notice. I don't have time to read through it. You can read through it when you get home. But the scenario is this. They, 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 Abimelech and the boys come to to Nashville and they say, I mean, to, to Grundy County and they say, Isaac, you, you, you a bad boy. And they say, and you know, we ain't never meant you no harm, huh? That's what they say. Read the text. You just, he said, we ain't never done that. He said, we have always blessed you and sent you forth with our blessings. Why are they there? Because they don't know with all of his money and power whether Isaac is building some kind of paramilitary operation which will then come back and exact vengeance on the boys in Gear and Philistines. And so they come to make You know, we've always been friends. <laughs> Don't you get a Christmas card every year? Fruitcake? Oh, we just want to make peace. Now, some of us would have said, now you on my land. Huh? Watch it. But that's not how conquerors conquer. The text 
text says, Isaac makes peace with him. Why? He don't have nothing against them. Making peace with them does not affect his stuff one bit. Why? Because conquerors live by the provisions of God. Conquerors trust in the promises of God. They conquer. Conquerors live by the provisions of God. Conquerors maintain by the praises to God. But in none of these areas are the areas where really God needed Isaac to conquer. My musicians begin to play slowly. I need to tell you before I leave this passage that everything that we have just read, all of the blessings, the wealth, the money, the power, everything we have just talked about for the last 48 minutes, all of it almost didn't happen. Huh? Yeah, we, we see Isaac when he's prospering but but there was another time in this passage go with me quickly to verse 7 almost didn't happen verse 7 the same chapter and the men of the place asked him about his wife and he said she is my sister. For he feared to say she is my wife, lest he and the men of the place should kill me for Rebecca. Because she was fair to look upon. I need you to read with me to the comma and then stop. And it came to pass when he had been in that place a long time. Isaac is we flashing back. He's back in Nashville. Just got the to town, and they say, Who is that on your on your arm, young brother? And he say, That's my wa 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 sister. Isaac assessed the situation as if it was a, a man versus man conflict. And because he saw more of them than it was of him, he told the same lie that his daddy told twice. And the text says that he lived in the city a long time. And there is no indication at this point that any of the blessings of God have come to Isaac. What Isaac didn't realize or remember is that it was God that called him to Gear. You don't got this situation right, my boy. This is not a man versus man conflict. Your problem is you don't understand this is a man versus the supernatural. And the question, Isaac, is do you believe that the God who brought you here is the same God that can keep you despite the forces around you? And for a long time, he lived in a little dinky apartment in the middle of, of the famine, struggling, trying to get by. And there was no blessing. Because even though conquerors trust in the promises of God, live by the provisions of God, maintain their praise to God, yet conquerors must trust in the power of God. And what God is saying in this passage is, Isaac, 
I don't need you to speak against or fight no storms. That's not the conqueror I need you to be. Uh, I don't need you to be out in the woods uh, uh, beating up and trying to give a beat down to the Philistines or the Gearites. The, the, that, that's not the kind of conqueror I've called you to be. Don't need you sleeping uh, in the bed resting on your laurels when you should be at the house of worship. But, but, but you've got to trust me. And during the time when Isaac was living a lie, there is no evidence of the blessings of God. The irony is last week we were dealing with somebody who committed murder and adultery. This week it was just a brother who told a little white lie. Huh? But the premise of our message is that even though God gives abundant grace, he does not release us from the responsibility of being conquered. In Isaac's case, his living a lie held up a progression that God had set up for him to move from wealth to filthy wealth to power. And the reason we're in this series is because even though we're living in difficult times, God has ordained it for some under the sound of my voice to be blessed abundantly by God. But because you have not conquered in the area of trusting God, Blessings, yea, abundant blessings are being held in the storehouses of heaven. This was a generational thing. Abraham told this same lie twice and yet just because Abraham did it, God did not excuse it in the life of Isaac. And until he got his lie straight, there were no blessings. And the Bible says, after this thing was cleared up, in that year, Isaac sold into the land and his return was a hundredfold. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. Heavenly Father, some of us want to battle, but you have not called us to be that kind of conqueror. Some of us going through storms and we, we want to we wanna declare with our mouths and, and suspend the storms, but, but you have not called us to be that kind of conqueror. Many of us are struggling with challenges, sins, areas where we have failed to trust you and, and you're saying to us, that's where I expect victory. And we say, Lord, I, I cannot trust you because if I do, I'll be in a worse spot than I am. And, and God stands silent. But you see in the word of God that it's very likely that your very struggles 
are due to your lack of trust in the power of God. And I stopped by to tell you today, it is in these areas of hereditary and cultivated tendencies toward evil. In these areas where we fail to trust in the power of God, that God is saying this afternoon, this is where conquerors conquer. These are the battles that I've set up for you to be victorious in. These other areas of conflict, I'll be your, your, your hero, but it is here. Where I've set my spirit to give power and victory. Even in this moment, your mind is racing. You're saying, Lord, I, I, I know where it is, where you expect me to be a conqueror. Yeah. It's not fighting with my neighbor. It's not getting my kids to act right not getting the members of my ministry to do what I need them to do. It's in that same thing that has plagued my, my daddy, my granddaddy, my cousin. That default thing that I do almost without thoughts before whispering a prayer. That's where conquerors Somebody standing to your feet right now and you're simply saying, God, give me power and help me to trust your power because that's where conquerors conquer. God has ordained that we be conquerors. And for many of us, the very blessings of heaven are dependent on Before we close today, I want to give somebody an opportunity to give your life to Jesus Christ. That's my first appeal. Very quickly, if you know you are not uh, the possession of Jesus Christ through a decision of your heart, Holy Ghost has been working on you before you came to this place today, but God has just sealed it for you this afternoon. And God is saying, I need you to take a short walk not like the ones that Isaac had to make, but a short walk from your seat down to the altar uh, where your journey can be begin. If, if that's you this afternoon, I need you to come very quickly. Give me a hand. Give God your hearts. Begin a brand new journey of victory and conquering in Jesus because that's where God would have you to conquer. Is there one this afternoon? Is there one this afternoon? He's more than enough. He's more than enough for me. He's more than enough. He's yeah. my provider. My provider. There's somebody in that valley of decision God has been calling you and you've run long enough you want to leave here with him as your savior today is there one I'm still calling you but I'm making a transition the Holy Ghost is calling you please come there may be someone else in the congregation that God has led you to this place and you know in your heart of hearts that this is the place where God has ordained that your Christian growth should continue from this point on. You're not saying that God has not blessed you and led you this far in your Christian experience, but every time you come to this place, God blesses you and grows you, and, and God says, this is where I need you planted uh, to grow you from this point on. You want to say, preacher, God is telling me I need to make the Oakland Park Seventh-day Adventist Church my church home. There may be some things I need to study. There may be some things I need to go through. But I know what God is calling me to do. 
I'm going to ask that you join me. God is turning us into a a body of conquerors. So if you want to conquer, there's no better place to be than this place because this is where this is where conquerors conquer. Is there another today? They're saying I already believe in Jesus Christ, but God is calling this to be my home. Won't you come? He's more than enough. More than enough. Even while I'm praying this prayer and the final prayer, you can come. Heavenly Father, your children are standing because we've looked around and we've seen areas where we have battled or where you have not called us to conquer. But you've called us either to rely on your power or to rely on your provision, Lord God, or even to rest in our praise. But but as we looked around the experience of our lives, we see areas where we have come short of your will and yea, even held up your blessing. And we're saying, no more, God. Give us the power to trust in your power. To believe that you have called us to be conquerors, God. And we want to walk forward, Lord God. So that every blessing of heaven that you have in store for us can be unleashed from the windows of heaven. Thank you, Father, for what you have done in this place today. Make somebody step a little straighter in somebody's experience.